My name is Penny Barsh. I have an adult son who has cerebral palsy and uh, an intellectual disability. It's still very difficult for me to discuss this, but he was in the hospital in the spring for three weeks with a serious condition and I was unable to support him, even with his limited communication skills. I contacted ARC and they advocated for a change in policy, which now allows guardians or loved ones to be with people with intellectual disabilities when they are hospitalized or in the ER. Um, please give today so ARC can continue to fight for us tomorrow. Good evening and welcome to the 2020 ARC of Connecticut Harvest of Hope virtual fundraising event through the cooking class, a culinary tour led by celebrity chefs. I'm Wynn Everts. I'm the executive director of the Ark Connecticut, and I'm also Nick's dad. Nick is our 30 year old son with an intellectual and developmental disability. If you're attending your first Harvest of Hope, let me give you a brief explanation about the organization that you're here supporting, and thank you very much for being here. The Art Connecticut is the state's oldest and largest advocacy organization committed to protecting the civil and human rights of individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities, otherwise referred to as IDD. We believe that individuals with IDD and their families deserve a seat at the table and to have their voices heard. We actively promote the inclusion of people with IDD in the full lives of the communities in which they choose to live. That is our vision. And with your help this evening, we can make that vision a reality for every person with IDD. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the problems for people with IDD grew and became fairly acute. A good example of that is that at the height of the pandemic, our community was confronted with Connecticut's decision, unlike the states of New York and New Jersey, for example, to not allow an individual to accompany a person with IDD into a hospitalization situation. The ARC Connecticut led the successful fight to reverse this policy and took a major worry off the minds of many parents in the state. Also during the pandemic, we learned a lot about our, humil uh, our humanity and our vulnerability. And tonight's program is designed to be a respite from that. Tonight, we're gonna to be joined by a collection of chefs who are gonna share their methods for making wonderful meals for special times, and also share with us what inspires them to create the things that they do. We'll also be joined by individuals and families that believe that the work of the Art Connecticut has helped them greatly. And then finally, you will notice that a number of us are sporting really awesome swag with the Art Connecticut logo on it that involves cooking and this merchandise is available for sale on our website. So we hope you learn a bit tonight, we hope you laugh tonight, and we hope you end up really loving tonight. Thank you for being here and bon appetit. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Fiorentino. I'm a member of the Ark of Connecticut Board of Directors. I'm here tonight with my sister Donna. Good evening. Donna and her husband Terry are the chefs responsible for the basically endless array of hot appetizers, cold appetizers that grace our in-person fundraisers. Those of you who uh, have been stuffing the appetizers in your pockets as you're walking out the door, um, well, you know who they are, right? right. And uh, I was telling my daughter Rose mm -hmm. that we were going to make um, Uncle Tom's marinara sauce yeah. for the ARC fundraiser. Right. And she said to me, um, Mom, uh, what Uncle Tom makes is yeah. not a marinara sauce. Yeah. So yeah. I okay. just, I would yeah. pass that along to you. Yeah. Two things come to mind. One, the uh, know-it-all tomato doesn't fall far from the know-it-all tomato bush, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, Rose is right. 
whatever, make the marinara sauce your own. Right. right. That's the thing about recipes. Go to five Italian restaurants, order marinara sauce, you're going to get five different things, right? That's right. I mean, there are some basic ingredients that, 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 that are in common, but make it your own. Right. And we chose this particular recipe because this is something you could really do on a, on yep. a weeknight, yep. you know, really quickly. And it's um, meant to be done quickly. And it's meant to, this is not a sauce that, you know, like a, a the other kind of tomato sauce that we make where you cook it for three or four hours. Right. This is a, a quick sauce, um, you know, probably things that you pro you have in your fridge, you know, uh, cherry tomatoes, either fre we use both fresh basil and uh, basil from our garden uh, pesto that we've made, fresh garlic, uh, we won't judge you if you use garlic out of a jar. Oh, no, we'll, uh, no, we'll judge you. Right. But and then, you do what you want to do. But just some some spices. So we're going to put that together first as kind of our basic sauce. Yep. And then we're going to bump it up a little bit and um, turn it into a puttanesca very quickly, again, very easily. You know, it's funny, thinking about what Rose said about, you know, that's not a marinara sauce. So we're out to dinner in the New Haven area, right? There's a table of older Italian men, and they're arguing. You know, it's a heated argument. And, 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 and you actually hear, the argument is about, do you break the pasta before you put it in the water, right? And whatever their mother did, that's the way you have to do it, right? right. So the fact that the mothers did it differently well, led, led to the fight. Right, right? and that was a, kind of a, a big thing, even in our family. Yeah. You know, we had a great aunt, yeah. Aunt Anna, and she would, as she was walking in the door, she would say, if you break the pasta, I won't eat it. Yeah. Right? She's so, like, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not eating. Aunt Anna didn't live next door. She she was c coming from Long Island, and the first the first words out of her mouth was, I won't eat it. I'm not eating that. Right? So, right. Did, did, did our family, there really was, it's quite a family. <laughs> um, so, uh, the thing about this also is when you cook this at your house, right, your house will fill with the fragrances, the aroma of this cooking. And it is a wonderful, wonderful, for, you'll be a hero. People are like, what is that? What are, you, what are we making? What are we having? Um, we used to go to my grandmother's house every Sunday, right? And we yes. would, by, way before we got to the back door, and we always, always came in the back door, yeah. um, you could smell the sauce or whatever she was cooking. So, uh, the sauce, and she always had that big pot on the stove yeah. with the ladle that yeah. she was you know, yeah. using, it, it, whatever. But it, the smell was right. it just, just, a reminds great, me, it's just a great memory. It reminds That's me of right. my grandmother and my big extended crazy right. family. So we will be working on this. Right. Meanwhile, we're going to have our first celebrity chef, Andy Blanton. Andy is the chef owner of Cafe Kandahar in Whitefish, Montana. He is also a four-time James Beard semi-finalist, which is really quite high, high honor. Uh, he will be making a duck recipe for us. Uh, before we leave, we just want to say, please give to the ARC. Um, it's always important right now with budget deficits and potential cuts, it's especially important that you support this organization that is there for you. Right? Right. So, so, thank you very much, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah, we'll see how Donna and I are doing on our marinara sauce. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Blanton. I'm the executive chef and owner of Cafe Kandahar in Whitefish, Montana. Today, I'll be preparing one of my all time favorite holiday dishes slow roasted duck with the honey pecan gravy, alongside some butternut squash and string beans. This is a very simple preparation, uh, very much in the style of Southern cooking, something I learned while I was in New Orleans and wanted to share with you so that you could share with you and your loved ones for this holiday season. Okay, so here we have about a five to six pound duck. Um, we have some Paul Perdome's Meat Magic, which you can find in most grocery stores. Um, some chopped onions, about a half of a medium sized onion with the small dice. And about six or seven garlic cloves here. And what we're going to do is we're going to season the duck. And we're going to liberally season it, just kind of showering the duck all over. And the idea is to season pretty much everything that you can see here. And I'm just liberally using the seasoning.
And the duck should have just a little bit of moisture once it's thawed. And so the seasoning should just stick right onto the duck itself. Let me get close up. And again, just looking to evenly coat the duck itself. So I'm not too worried about over seasoning, mainly because ducks are so full of fat and salt isn't really uh, soluble in fat. So essentially this is just gonna help season the whole meat. So I've got this duck, it's seasoned on all sides as you can see. I've got the breast side up. What I'm gonna do is just open the cavity and sprinkle the onions in. And I'll use the other hand just to stuff it up into the cavity. Make sure you've removed all of the gizzards, the liver, and the neck. So we've got our chopped onion, chopped garlic, and then finally some rosemary sprigs. About an ounce of rosemary sprigs, just a nice little bundle. And we want to stick that right into the cavity. And I'm not too worried about closing it, but they, they come with a little bit of fat, and I can just sort of gently seal it together. Maybe a little seasoning on the fat. So again, we've got it nice and all evenly and liberally seasoned. I'll set this into a pan, just like so. Notice how I put the fat underneath. It just tucks underneath. Same with the rear area, just tuck that in. This is it. I'll stick this in a 250 degree oven for five hours and we'll pull it out and see how we're looking. All right, it's about time to check our duck. I'm gonna pull it out of the oven here. You can see the amount of fat that has collected, which is great because it fat, uh, when you cook something in fat, it's like confit. It'll make it really tender. What we're looking for, we've got a nice dark brown crust on the duck. Most uh, you know, if it's this was about just over five pounds for the size of the duck. If it's closer to six pounds, it might take five and a half hours at 250. What I'm looking for is this wing. Notice how as soon as I grab it, it just sort of pulls away. Same with the leg. It's it's real tender, so to speak. So when you go to move it, the whole thing's going to move. It's it's essentially going to let you know that all your meat's done. At this point, we're just going to allow this to cool. Uh, your whole house should smell like duck as well. Everybody should be hungry. We need to let it cool because once we go to carve it and sort of debone it, we'll need for the meat to slightly be cooler and we can always rewarm it back in the oven. So we're gonna let this cool. Okay, so while the duck is cooling, I'll go over the quick sauce for the honey pecan gravy. We've got diced onions, olive oil, bay leaf, salt, cayenne, and black pepper. We have dark roux, duck stock, very dark roasted pecans. This is important, as is the dark roux. The pecans we wanna roast for almost about 30 minutes at 325 degrees so that they get very dark brown. Brown is the color of flavor. That's what we learn in Louisiana. I mentioned Paul Perdome earlier. He looks like Dom DeLuise, but he is the godfather of Cajun and Creole cooking. So the darker the roux, the darker the nut, the nuttier the flavor, the better the flavor. Because again, brown is the color of flavor. So I've got a nice brown duck stock. For the dark roux and duck stock, you can purchase dark roux online or you can Google how to make dark roux. There's many different recipes, but the color of this, almost chocolate brown, it's really gonna give a nutty aroma and flavor to the sauce. So here I've got a medium saucepan. I'll put the olive oil in the hot pan and we're gonna begin sweating the chopped onion. And really the idea here is keep it over medium low heat. And we want these onions to essentially begin to turn color because again, brown's the color of flavor. So we're gonna sweat the onions, let them turn brown, and we'll pick it back up once we get a little color on these onions. All right, so now our onions, notice how they're beginning to caramelize. That's the color we're looking for. Get that out of there. We're gonna add our salt, a little bit of red pepper, 
just the tiniest bit of red pepper any more and it gets too spicy fancy black pepper grinder she should get one of these if you don't have one and then finally the bay leaf and one thing to note is uh, we always like to toast spices in a little bit of oil so just a few tosses if you can't toss then pick something up and stir but practice the toss it's more fun that way next up we're going to deglaze with our duck stock And one thing to note about this, the duck stock, if you don't have duck stock, you don't want to take the time to make it, then get a low sodium chicken broth. It'll work just as well. Maybe the flavor won't be as good, but uh, it should work just as fine. One thing to note about the dark roux, as I said, you can purchase it online, uh, but if you make your own and you can't get it this dark, not to worry. It's really just used as a thickener and the flavor ingredient, especially if you can get your pecans, again, nice and dark brown. Black is the, uh, the color of not flavor, but bitter. So in cooking, we look for dark brown. Black often is really when the sugars have fully, fully cooked, which means they're burnt. At this point, I'm bringing our uh, broth up to a boil and I've got the cold roux. Very important when you add roux. These need to be two different temperatures. So hot liquid, cold roux. I stir some of that up. Plus when the liquid is boiling, it'll let you know how much you're able to thicken because the flour gelatinizes in boiling liquid. And so I'm stirring this in. You should really be able to smell the great sauce. We've got the color of gravy. Gravies are always tasty. So again, it's all about the flavor. I'm gonna bring that to a boil. And once I get it boiling as so, I'm gonna reduce the heat and let it simmer for about 10 to 15 minutes. So we cook out that starch taste. Okay, so the duck had a chance to rest. And at this point, you could grab a knife. If you wanna be a heathen, just cut it up and serve it with the bones and all, right? But if you wanna be sophisticated, which uh, I think we all do, and have some fun, let's get into picking the duck. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the wings off, just like so. And I'm gonna eat those because they're delicious and you went through all this time to roast the duck. Just put a cut right down the middle. Since the meat's cut or cooked, it's gonna be real easy to find out where that breastbone is. What we're looking for is to find the half. So there's one half. There's my other half there. Well, we'll do this side first. Nonetheless, watch how I just open the duck and it should just come right off the backbone like so. Notice it's still hot. The, re the reason we gotta let this thing cool is because it's still cooking. When you pull this duck out of the oven, the bones are still hot. And as a result, we're still gonna be cooking the meat. I'm gonna scrape any of the coatings off. Oh, there we go. There's our breastbone. Nonetheless, now I, I pulled the breastbone out. I've got a little bone up top here, which attaches to the wishbone, comes out. Okay, so now there's the rest of that wing bone. Notice I just pull the meat back with it. Now I've got to get the leg out. I think I might have pulled there, but basically what you're looking for is any bone. I, of course, am using gloves because the duck, as you can see, is still very warm. But notice how when I work with this duck, it's falling apart. So I'm getting the leg bone out like so and then for this part I'm gonna fold back the meat and you can choose to use the leg bone or not but notice this here this is a bunch of fat that comes underneath the skin well that's a good thing I call it bubblegum fat because of the way it looks it looks like chewed up bubblegum I'm gonna use a spoon and just scrape very gently so I don't tear the skin. All of that, what I would call 
bubble gum fat off. So what we're looking to do is remove any of that fat because we've already got what we wanted out of it, which is the flavor. And so this will help keep the skin nice and crispy in the duck itself. I still gotta remove this leg bone here. So what I do is I open it up, use my fingers to peel the meat off the bone. And then for this skin, you can just kind of twist, twist it through. And I'm gonna fold all of that back up. I'm gonna use my hands to give it a nice little thing. And voila, we've got a boneless half duck ready for service. If I'm serving multiple people, I might just give that a little cut so that we have a couple portions. And we'll sample. All right, our sauce has had a chance to simmer for a good 15 minutes. Notice how there's a bit of oil that sometimes will collect on the top. I'm gonna skim that off because essentially that's just a little bit of oil left over from the roux and it'll help just make a cleaner gravy. But anyway, I'll skim that off there like so till there's just about nothing left. Then I'm gonna add pecans and honey. And then I'll check the seasoning. We can use a spoon or your fingers. Hot sauce. Very good. Sauce tastes great, looks great. Nice, rich colored gravy. We'll let the pecans infuse. We're gonna come over here. And if you have a searzol, you can use it because they're really fun. If you don't, you can use a broiler. But if you got a searzol, you might as well use the searzol, right? So this is just creating a really hot service. And what we're gonna do is use this to help crisp the skin of the duck itself. And it happens almost instantaneously. And this will just create that nice crispy skin that we all like. We're really just going for a nice dark brown here. Again, use the broiler. If you use the broiler, you can put a little bit of moisture underneath have some fun like that. I can tell it's nice and crispy. I've got my roast butter nut. We're gonna uh, put that in the center of the plate. I like it because it's colorful, it's fall, it's tasty. You don't have to do butter nut. You can make a cornbread dressing. You can make mashed potatoes. You can make whatever your little heart desires or your big heart desires for those big hearted folks. Some green beans. Again, nice and colorful. We're keeping this real rustic because this is all about flavor. It's all about center of the plate and comfort food, holidays, celebrating with friends, celebrating the color of flavor. So slow roast duck, don't be shy on that gravy either. Roast butternut squash, honey pecan gravy, string beans, they're Christmas colored too. Enjoy your holiday season. Thank you all so much. Hope you enjoyed. Cheers. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm an advocate for people with IDD. My friend at the Connecticut Art helped me grow and be more confident. Shan Nguyen showed me how to find my own voice. I try and make a difference for everyone with a disability. Please get today so the art can keep fighting for it tomorrow. Hi everyone, welcome back. Thanks so much Andy, that really looked good. While Andy was presenting his recipe, Donna and I have been working on our marinara sauce and we've gotten as far as sauteing the chopped garlic in extra virgin olive oil. Right. And you want to make sure that it just gets to the point where it's kind of a, a golden brown, right. uh, which gives the, um, it'll give the oil and the sauce kind of a nutty um, flavor. And you want to make sure you don't go too far. Yeah, if you go too far, you know, you're basically, you burn it. Now, there is a trick. If you burn the garlic, there's a trick that my mother taught me. So the first thing you do is you turn the heat down, get the saute pan off of the stove, okay? 
then you're gonna take the saute pan, you're gonna walk to the garbage, and you're gonna dump it out. What's the matter with you? Because you, you, it's it's a start over again. How hard is that, right? You can't. It will ruin the sauce. Yeah, you if can't do it with, dark. Dark. Yeah, with right. the black black and growing. Right. You know, okay. All right. Can I add this? Do? I'm add. gonna add the tomatoes. Okay. It's gonna splatter a little bit. So we're adding our fresh cherry tomatoes. Right. Crank it up a little. So. Cherry tomatoes, available year-round, pretty uh, constant sugar content in them. Um, they're easy to use, easy to find. Now, if it's native tomato season around, you know, where you live, you know, August, September, use the natives. But for the rest of the year, because unfortunately we live where we live, these are your best bet. You know, the ones that you get in the, in the store, say like in January, they look red. But, you know, I could paint a plastic ball to make it look red, and I wouldn't want to eat that either, okay? So, while the tomatoes are cooking down and spicing. That's right, yep. But I added a little oregano. Try to crush it in your hands because it releases the flavor. A little bit of salt. Um, right. And we're going to start just with a little bit of uh, crushed red pepper. Right. Little by little. Little by you, little. You can always add it, but you can't take it out mm -hmm. once it's in. So. And you know, you can vary the spices to your taste and your family's taste. That's right. Don and I have been busy. Uh, we put in our tomatoes and we're... Right. And the tomatoes have cooked for probably like 10 minutes. Right. And so they're blistering a little bit. And then we're just taking a wooden spoon yep. and just kind of pushing down on them. We're going to use every part of this. This isn't where, this isn't a... A recipe where we're going to get rid of the seeds or the skins or anything like it's all going to be used as part of the sauce so we're just kind of squishing down whenever i see a wooden spoon you know it brings back memories of being chased through the house never caught but chased through the house i was about 18 before i i finally realized that a wooden spoon was actually had a cooking purpose you could use, use it for cooking and it wasn't just a grammar yeah, a disciplinary yeah, tool yeah, yeah, yeah. that was in the um, in the in the kitchen. Um, nothing like being chased by, you know, a by, little by, Italian grandma. Yeah, by your grandma. That's right. Um, so Da has uh, squished these down. The sauce is really coming together now, and you know, I I, I don't want to make this seem complicated because it really yeah. really isn't. Very you easy. know, we're kind of adding a little oregano, a little crushed red pepper. And people want to know: is it a quarter of a teaspoon? Is it a half a teaspoon? You know, it's, you gotta taste it as you go along. Right. Some people like it really zippy, they really like a lot of that red pepper taste. Some people really don't like it. Same with the oregano, the salt. Taste it as you go along, right? Right. I mean, that's, that's right. So know. we're gonna get our pasta going. Ah, uh, yes. Right? Um, Try to avoid the big controversy. Right. So, and have you um, salted the water? I salted the water. Oh, no, right. no, no, I haven't no? salted the water. Okay. I was thinking about okay. doing it in the If you don't salt your water, uh, if your pasta will taste black. I mean, it really makes a big difference. So, so this is something, I know most people just pour the salt in. Honestly, I like I, I just take like a, a little taste of the water and see if it's salty enough. You don't want it to taste like the ocean, but you gotta taste the salt, otherwise the pasta's gonna be awful, right? right? So you need a little bit more. So now, we're gonna take this, and in keeping with my Aunt Anna's advice, we're coming down, on the side of the people who break the pasta rather than put it in a hole. So That's forgive right. us, everybody that for whom this is uh, blasphemy. Blasphemy, but you know, hey. All right. So it. Tom, who's who's up next after right. this? Up next is Robert Ubaldo, chef owner of the Farmer's Table in New Canaan, Connecticut. And Chef Ubaldo is going to make a beef stew, and I love beef stew. As much as I love Italian food, I love beef stew. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this recipe. Once again, can Don and I just remind you, it's so important. Please give. See you soon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chef Robert Ubaldo, and uh, I'm at the Farmer's Table in New Canaan, at uh, New Canaan, Connecticut. Today I'm going to be doing a recipe or shortbread beef stew. Uh, the variation on this is that I'm going to be using shortbreads instead of a beef top round or something like that. But I'm going to show you that there's a lot of ways that you can do this. It doesn't have to be limited to beef stew. I'm going to show you how to do the recipe so uh, that you can do this with anything. Tofu, pork, 
lamb, beef, chicken, whatever you decide to make in a stew, and it is stew season, um, this is the way that you can do it. I'm going to start out, since this is a short beef, beef stew, I'm going to start out by cleaning the beef short rib. Now, you can get this at the grocery store from your butcher. Um, you can probably even buy it online and have it delivered. I'm going to get a pan nice and hot. And I'm going to trim all the extra fat off the short rib. Now, these things are pretty fatty, but that's what makes them a good piece to use for a beef stew because they're well marbled. Oftentimes, if you use a beef top round or some other cut, they can be really dry at the end or tough, even if you braise them for a long time. The dryness is what I'm trying to avoid here. So. Remember that you can substitute lamb for this recipe, leg of lamb, uh, and most of these things you can buy boneless. I've done it with chicken, tofu, pork, any kind of protein that you want to use. It's up to you. And that's uh, part of the beauty of stew recipes is that you can really tailor it to yourself. However you want it. And the variations on the vegetables, the spices, everything, is, it, it really does lend itself to home cooking. Now, one of the problems when you make stew is that the meat takes a lot longer to cook than the vegetables. In this case, the meat is going to take two hours. So, I don't really want to cook the carrots and the celery and the onions and everything else for two hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with the beef and get that almost ready. Just about 40 minutes before it's ready, I'm going to put in the vegetables. And the other good thing about that is that if you really want to, you can cook the meat ahead of time. It makes its own stock. Cook the meat the day ahead of time and then finish it off the next day. And there's another beauty to this is that while this meat is cooking, you can do all your other prep. It'll give you plenty of time. Finishing up the beef now. You see, you can get a good look at this meat. It's really well marbled. It's not going to dry out even with long time cooking. I think my pan is probably nice and hot right now. I salt and pepper this stuff first. Sometimes people flour it, you can do that. But we're going to add any thickener a little later on in the recipe. There's a couple of different places where you can add it. And you can even do it at the end, so I'll show you both of those. Alright. Meat goes in the pan. And this is the part where you're really building flavor right now. I want this to be nice and brown on all sides. Alright. Now if you're giving them this with lamb or pork or chicken, um, you can do the same thing. Uh, same thing with tofu. While we're doing it with tofu, I'd probably use the non stick tank because it is very sticky. It's real difficult to get, even on a hot pan, to uh, keep from sticking. Now is the point when it's nice and brown, ready to go, you can use and add. Again, there's your variations that you can use. I'm going to use chicken stock, but you can use water, mushroom stock, beef stock. Remember to use too much, because what's going to happen now is it's going to reduce quite a bit, and you want to have enough in the end. Um, and the, good, the other good thing about this, you can always add more water. So what's going to happen is when this reduces, it's going to probably cook for about two hours. Uh, and when it's done reducing, it's going to have a really nice sauce. It's going to be a really nice broth uh, with lots of flavor. So if you really want to use water and a little bit of red wine, you can do that, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's going to come out just as good. Um, fresh herbs, I usually put in towards the end, uh, salt and pepper, dried herbs, so don't, don't, don't be afraid to use things like dried thyme, uh, dried rosemary, sage, things like that are just fine. So, I'm going to After about two 
two hours when your meat is almost, I gotta take a piece of meat out and try it. And see if it's tender enough so that it's almost ready. And that's the point where you're gonna put your vegetables in the pan. Uh, the other way to do this is to cook the vegetables while the meat is cooking and just turn them off when they're ready. Uh, you can do, do that in water, strain them, and then put the vegetable in. Now that's a real time saver because you don't have to wait that extra 40 minutes or 30 minutes it takes to cook the vegetables. Um, when you make the stew, so you can do it probably in under two hours, depending on the meat or, or whatever protein you use. So this can be a pretty quick dish. And please feel free to use your own variations. There's no, uh, there's no set laws for any of this. Uh, while this meat is cooking down, it's a good time to season it now. Let's say our meat is almost ready right now. I'm going to probably put in some fresh rosemary. I've got a little bit of fresh thyme or a little bit of dry thyme. Uh, Wait until the eggs are salted because you don't know what's going to uh, what's going to taste like after all the vegetables. A little bit of tomato paste always helps. And if you choose some red wines, so what you're doing here is you're building a really nice, a really good stew broth. It should be should be fairly thick by this point after about an hour and a half. To probably reduce you have a little bit of uh, a little bit of extra liquid now and so now's a good time to add the vegetables and more water if you need to so for this particular stew got some onions a bit of celery again don't be afraid to use your own stuff you want to put in peas mushrooms be considerate of the amount of time it's going to take to cook the vegetables that you're putting in. Strain beans. A little bit of squash. And now you can go off on a tangent and um, when I make pork stew or when I make some of the other southwestern kind of dishes, now it's a great time to add chilies, tomatoes, cilantro, all the things that make it what it is. Uh, fresh cumin, um, one of my favorite things is, uh, is pork and green chilies too. And this is a great way to start it out. So you don't really, you're not really tied down to anything. Uh, when these vegetables are cooked, we're going to take a look at the thickness of the broth. And if it looks like it's not quite thick enough, well, there's a way to fix that. And it also adds richness to the dish. Um, it's a little bit old fashioned, but I like to put in a little roux at the end. The biggest thing that the stove will but we have lighters for that. So that 
I can get all the lumps out. And whisk it in evenly. See what's happened here is that we've got a pretty rich broth right now. Once you add a little bit of thickener to this, it's going to make all the difference. You don't have to go overboard. A little bit goes a long way. Sometimes people over thicken stews. And one of the biggest problems with stews, of course, is that by the time it's done cooking, if you're not careful with the vegetables and the meat, you have cooked meat and a bunch of really mushy vegetables. And one of the beauties of a good stew is that you can tell the difference between the different ingredients. You have a clearly defined carrot, potato, celery, or whatever else you put in it. What I'm going to do is add this fruit in. That has been thinned out with some of the stock. So what to do? We'll whisk it around a little bit. Get it incorporated. And stoned magic. And we have our thickened beef stew. Now usually after that, if you need a little more water to put in here, a little more stock, please add it. Get things cooked up. A good proportion of water you should be about even with the top of the vegetables and the beef. When you're cooking the beef in this particular recipe, you're going to have to go a couple of inches above the beef when you're cooking it. So even if you use chicken or any other or any other protein, um, you should be able to put these simple rules pretty much wing the recipe with any protein. Right now, this is nice and thick. It's going to be well. All the vegetables are going to be cooked shortly. And through the miracle of modern science and extra pans, I have some, some stew that is ready. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, best garnish I can think of is a nice loaf of, nice loaf of bread. Sourdough bread, a little bit of fresh herbs. And there's your dish. Now don't forget, stew does not have to go alone. Have egg noodles, rice. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can put in stew that you can put in beef stew. That makes it beautiful. Okay. Don't forget the noodles, the rice, and please don't forget, add yourself to it. Make it the way you want it. And that is all. My name's Kate Hollins and I live in Waterford with my son Chris, who has intellectual and developmental disabilities. When Chris was turning 22, the proposed Connecticut state budget didn't include funding for new grads. As a result of the fierce advocacy of the ARC, funding was restored. The ARC is and has been the primary organization to advocate, secure funding, provide information, and support families like ours. It's because of the ARC that Chris is not only able to live in his community, he is thriving. Please give today so the ARC can keep fighting for us tomorrow. Hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you so much, Chef Ubaldo, that looked wonderful. Don and I, meantime, are at a point where our, we have a marinara sauce. That's right. And if you wanted to stop right here, you could. Take your pasta, mix it in the sauce. Don't do it the other way around, right? You don't get a thing of pasta and put your sauce on, on top of it. That's the Chef Boyardee commercial. That's not Italian food, all right? So we're gonna, uh, if we were, to just stop with the marinara sauce, we take the pasta right out of the boiling water and right. put it in. But we're not stopping there. We're going to turn this into, into, a, a, into a puttanesca. Yep. Right? So we're just going to add a couple of things. Um, I'm going to start with the anchovy. 
Yeah, so these anchovies, there's maybe three, or this is for pound of pasta, maybe three or four right. anchovy fillets mashed up. All mashed. Yep. And I know no what people even... say, I don't eat anchovies. You say, no, okay, you may need it. This is like a this is like a seascape painter, an artist saying, I don't use blue. If you're making this kind of food, the anchovies are sort of an essential part of it. It's an undertone. It's not going to hit you right over the That's head. That's right. You don't, you don't taste that strong, fishy flavor. But it adds but a it layer adds. that you really, that you that really you need, need and you're going to like. So anyway, it's in there. Now this just turned a vegan, uh, if you left the cheese out, the grated cheese out, or a vegetarian dish, into a non-vegetarian dish if you add the anchovies, obviously. We're also adding sliced up Sicilian green olives, and black Kalamata olives. Yeah. Tommy, turn this down a little bit. It adds uh, a briny taste, which is sort of essential to this dish. We're also going to add some capers, which have their own unique flavor, a very Mediterranean flavor. Oh, right? Really key for, for a puttanesca. Yeah, and you can get these, obviously, anywhere. Um, okay, so we'll depending, you know, do we get the little spoon tasted? Is it hot enough? Is it salty enough? Is it got enough cheese? You get used to it. You'll you'll you know you'll know what yours is supposed to taste like, and you'll make it taste like that consistently. Um, first time you do it, you know. See okay. You, and see how you do, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. This is ready. That fast, it's turned from a marinara into a puttanesca. The sauce uh, is ready. The pasta is ready. Right. Put a bit right. Closer. And so what we're doing now is we're we're pulling the pasta out of the water. And we're actually dragging some of that nice kind of starchy water into the sauce. Now, this is you would not do this with a traditional, like a thick uh, spaghetti sauce because you wouldn't want to water it down. But in this case, it kind of lightens up the oil in the sauce. And as my mother used to say, it, it, it just makes the pasta slide, kind of. It just makes a, it's a nice texture. So we're gonna finish this up, and we actually, at this point, we're just gonna add like a ladle of the starchy pasta water. And then we're just gonna let this sit for like five to 10 minutes, just so that it absorbs all of that really good sauce, absorbs right into the pasta. So Tom, who's up, who's up next? Well. Up next is our cousin. Oh, excellent. Rob Mufucci. Rob is the chef owner of Mies Trattoria in Hartford. Rob uh, has actually been on national TV with Bobby Flay and in the uh, Beat Bobby Flay series. He's going to share his very unique bolognese recipe with you. And I'm going to once again ask for your support for the Art of Connecticut. Please give. It's so important. Um, when Rob's done, we'll come back and we'll be ready to eat this. So, Perfect. thank you for watching so far. Hi, this is Rob Mapucci, chef and owner of Beast Trotteria. Welcome to my kitchen. Today we're going to do a pasta dish. It's a, a bolognese, very traditional Italian dish, but done in a new, amazing way that you've never seen before. I guarantee it. And um, this would be great for the holidays, or if you have a lot of time on your hands in uh, your home, uh, you know, secluded in your house during these times, um, maybe you can uh, put something like this together. But uh, let's get started. This dish actually has 24 ingredients, from stewed tomatoes to fresh fennel, onion, garlic, carrots, celery, ground beef, ground sausage, um, some cheeses like Regatta cheese, um, butter, heavy cream. We have extra virgin olive oil. We have truffle oil. We have pesto. We have all the makings of some great things. So let's get going. Ready? Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, a marrow and that's going to consist of some fresh fennel, some onions, some garlic some uh, carrots so we're going to cut up the carrots cut them up we, we dice or, or rough chop a lot of times so when you're doing something like this you don't want the carrots to be too big so you want them to be about a little less than a half inch like that maybe you know a quarter of an inch or something 
So we're going to chop these up. You don't have to be perfectly symmetrical because we're Italian. You don't have to be for quantities either. Why? Because these recipes have been handed down for generations. And that's about all I'm going to tell you. Sure, we're all familiar with some nice knife safety. So when you're when you're cutting something, it's always good to put a flat bottom on it so it's stable. So when you cut, it doesn't move on you. you know? And when you cut, you also cut against your fingers like that. Notice I'm not looking and I'm not cutting myself. Okay. So Enough chopping. We're going to throw all this together. And what have you chopped? We have fennel, we have onions, we have garlic, we have um, celery, we have uh, carrots, and that's going to go in a pan. Cooking off the maracuja. Get that started with a little bit of uh, blended oil. Nothing too expensive. We're going to basically sweat these things down and we're going to add them uh, to our meats. We're going to actually put the ground sausage and the ground beef in there and cook it all down. Get that going. Meanwhile, I'm gonna chop up some fresh herbs. What are we chopping? A little, a little basil and uh, parsley. down those tomatoes and it'll be a perfect like tomato ragu that we can add to the meat sauce. Okay, so we've cooked down our tomatoes so we have a nice tomato sauce. We've actually uh, cooked down our meat sauce. You can get a nice shot of that. This is what it looks like when it's all mixed and cooked down. So then we're going to, we're going to actually just add these together. we finish it. So while that kind of marries together, we're going to do something like Now, we're going to turn to the pasta. 
Now, we're gonna do something a little unusual, something you've probably never seen before. We have some chocolate pasta. What's that you say? You've never heard of chocolate pasta? That's because I invented it. Yes, I actually invented pasta. So, uh, like you at home, I have a pasta maker that, you know, cooks pasta. You know, so I always have boiling water going on the stove. But the cure, the, the really, the, the cool thing about when you're, when you're cooking pasta is to make sure that you have plenty of salt in the water. Now, when you put salt in the water, you want it to be, be uh, salty water, but not quite as salty as soup. That is going to really bring out the pasta in, in all of its glory and the flavor and the texture. So we're gonna drop in some of our Pappardelle pasta. And, and for those at home who don't have a pasta maker. Well, you can buy pasta. Uh, you can drive, you know, if you can drive. If you want to, if you challenge yourself, if you think you can do it, um, you can get a KitchenAid mixer and try to make a pasta. Um, flat pastas are pretty good, spaghetti, fettuccine, uh, linguine, pappardelle, you can, they make cutters like that for, for, all, for all sizes. You can try, you can find that at like your, your uh, department stores, or I'm sure you can find it online. But here's what we got right here. See how, what, how the pasta looks? So this pasta is a, a simple recipe, uh, and it's like any other pasta except we use unsweetened cocoa powder in the flour, and that gives it a, a savory, earthy flavor, rather than, um, you know, something sweet like you would think. When people hear the word chocolate pasta, they're thinking, oh my god, I don't want to go near it. But in fact, it's uh, an amazing combination when you put all these ingredients together, like we're going to do right now. So, so fresh pasta takes about two minutes, depending on the thickness and the style. So we're going to fold that right in. I'm gonna marry the pasta with the sauce. So it's okay to have a little bit of water in there. It kind of, you know, gives it a, a little bit of um, ability to join the sauce and it won't dry out as much. So, put that up again. So we combined our sauce and our, and our pasta. It's been working together now and it's ready to be plated. Nest it up. It's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good. Okay, we start that way. Now we're gonna get to our finishing ingredients. Which so we're gonna finish it with a little bit of regatta, a little fresh pesto, and a little Sicilian trick we do with a, a, a gramelade. In this case it's an orange. So, the orange oils, the zest, all that stuff combines with the, the meats and the, and the vegetables and it, and it brings out the flavors of the truffle oil in the pasta, the chocolate in the pasta. Orange and chocolate go really well together. And then to top it off, we use a little bit of nutmeg and cinnamon. To give it that really comfort food experience. So. Bon appetit. So, you've seen what we've done. If you'd like to try that at home, that's great. You know, if you have a more ingredients in your house and do one dish, you know, more power to you. Otherwise, the only thing you have to really know how to make these days is a reservation. So I suggest Mies Trattoria. You know, come over, we'll drink some wine, we'll talk, we'll eat. It'll be great. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. God bless you. Salters. I have an intellectual disability and I'm an advocate. How the Ark of Connecticut has helped me is by having lobby days and legislation days at the Capitol so I can testify and make sure the budget isn't cut. The Ark of Connecticut speaks up for us and to make sure the budget is not cut. Please give today so the Ark of Connecticut can keep fighting for us tomorrow. Hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you so much, Rob, for that beautiful recipe. Um, I don't know if you noticed the uh, picture behind Rob at the end there. That's my grandmother in the, the, uh, the same picture that we have in our kitchen that uh, we started this segment with. 
is uh, you know my grandmother standing at her stove uh, on Franklin Avenue cooking, which is how we always, which is how we always remember. Her. Right, and and that um, charcoal, uh, my dad did of her standing at her stove, and my aunts and uncles and my cousins, we have, we all have that in our kitchens. It's kind of a nice, nice thing that we have. So I should say we're joined by my son Daniel. <laughs> Uh, and we're about to bring this over, right. uh, to plate it, as we say in the restaurant biz. Uh, you do that okay? Yeah, I got okay. it. I just want to say, our families, Don's family and my family, have basically been quarantining together since May. Uh, yes, we have. So it's been, a, it's been a nice thing to have a little yep. bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, extra Basically. company. Okay. Hi, my name is Lori Coughlin. I'm a parent of a young woman with ID as well as an independent support broker. I've been working with a young man who wants desperately to move out of his family home, but he is very low on the DDS wait list. I reached out to the ARC and they were able to connect me to a state agency that had a program allowing us to access resources for this young man. And I am very happy to report a year later, he has moved into his own condo. He has hired his own staff and is well on his way. Please, please support the ARC today as they continue to fight for us tomorrow. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope you had some fun. I hope you got some ideas on new recipes. And, you know, I hope the ARC raised some money because the work of the ARC is just so important. It's fitting, I think, that we uh, sort of end our, our part with our families because the ARC was founded by families. It's been there to serve families for many, many years. I won't go over all the very, very long list of accomplishments, but I, I do want to share something that happened just recently during the height of COVID um, that I think illustrates how important this organization truly is. And that is, we found out that Connecticut, unlike New York, unlike New Jersey, had adopted a policy whereby a person with an intellectual disability who had to be hospitalized would not be accompanied by a family member or other loved one. They would be there alone. That just struck fear into all of us who imagined our children or brothers or sisters, our adult children, sometimes our actual uh, uh, minor children in that situation by themselves. People who for their entire lives have had mom, dad, somebody with them every step. And at this point, at this point, the state of Connecticut had mandated that they would be alone. Well, that was unacceptable to us and we led a coalition that got that reversed. It was not easy. It took a lot of work, but we changed it. We changed it for our kids, for your kids, for our families, for your families. And that is the ARC. So, uh, on a happier note, I just want to say thank you. Yep. Of course, I don't have a glass of wine. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please do what you can to support us. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. To Bye. everyone. The thank town. you for supporting the ARC. Bon Natale. All right. Thank you, guys. Hello again. That concludes our program for this evening, and we hope that you enjoyed being with us tonight. Thank you very much for supporting the ARC Connecticut tonight. Your support will enable the ARC's advocacy and your voice to continue to be heard with respect to individuals with IDD receiving the support that they need to live the lives that they choose in their communities. I'd like to thank 
our celebrity chefs this evening who brought their expertise and inspiration to this evening and made this evening so special. I'd also like to say a significant thank you to our sponsors and attendees whose generous contributions made this evening a success. And finally, I'd like to thank the individuals and families that formed the Harvest of Hope Committee that put together this event using their personal and professional energy, experience, and expertise. On behalf of the Board of the Ark of Connecticut and the Harvest of Hope Committee and the staff of the Ark of Connecticut, I wish you a happy and healthy holiday season and new year. Thank you and good night.